have never before introduced a speaker who had appeared on the Forbes list of 30 under 30. <laughs> Kevin Roos did. Based on the award-winning bestseller he wrote as a college student, The Unlikely Disciple, a sinner's semester at America's holiest university. About the semester he spent at Jerry Falwell's ultra-conservative Liberty University. Kevin Roos's insatiable curiosity has take him, taken him in many different directions in the meantime. But first, a word about why a renowned New York Times columnist on technology is offering Kendall at Oberlin a presentation on Zoom from his home in the Bay Area. Kevin's late grandparents, Kenneth and Gretchen Roos, were influential founders of Kendall at Oberlin. Just one of Kenneth Roos's many distinctions was having served as a member of the President's Council of Economic Advisors. Kevin's late father, Kirk, was an attorney and activist in Oberlin, and his mother, Diana Roos, a retired assistant to a former president of Oberlin College, remains very much an activist and has served on the board of Kendall at Oberlin. Kevin's second book, Young Money, reported on the lives of junior Wall Street investment bankers, eight of whom he shadowed for months following the financial crisis of 2008. The title of his most recent book is Future Proof, A Guide to Surviving the Technological Future. As his work attests and his website confirms, Kevin has an appetite for adventure. Real Future, the TV documentary he produced and co-hosted, afforded opportunities among others to interview a revenge porn king and to invite a team of world-class hackers to hack him. Rabbit Hole, Kevin's podcast, examines the influence of the internet on our beliefs and behavior. You may have seen his recent review of a book on artificial intelligence in the New York Times, part of which he had artificial intelligence software composed with quite astonishing results. Welcome, Kevin Roos. Thank you for the wonderful introduction, Marjorie. And I'll just um, add two other uh, qualifications that, uh, that you left off your list, one of which is my, I, in addition to being the proud grandson of Ken and Gretchen Roos, I am also the grandson of Warren and Jeanette Wicks, um, both of whom were Kendall at Oberlin residents. Um, my my last qualification is that I believe I, I hold the record for most table tennis games played on the table tennis table in the nursing wing of Kendall at Oberlin. So uh, if anyone wants to challenge me um, on my next trip uh, back home, uh, I'm, I'm formidable. I'll just warn you. Um, or at least I was when I was uh, a preteen. Um, well, today I'm not here to talk about table tennis. I'm here to talk about uh, my uh, research and my reporting on artificial intelligence, including um, the book you see behind you called Future Proof, uh, Nine Rules for Humans in the Age of Automation, which came out uh, last uh, spring and is coming out in paperback, I believe, next week, although I'm not sure about that. Um, the supply chain comes for us all, so it's been delayed a bit. Um, and I'm just going to introduce you to a few of the sort of things I've been thinking and writing about recently with, um, with respect to artificial intelligence, because I, I think it's one of the most important subjects um, in the world today, and it's one that I don't think is getting nearly enough attention. So um, I first started thinking about artificial intelligence and automation um, about a decade ago. At the time, I was a junior reporter at the New York Times, and I was on the finance desk. And so my job was, uh, in part, to write corporate earnings reports. So, you know, four times a year, companies would put out their 
earnings and announcements. And I would quickly scan them and pull out all the relevant numbers and plug them into a story and publish it very quickly so that people could use that information to trade stocks or whatever they wanted to do. And uh, it was not the most scintillating part of my job, but it was an important part and, and I took pride in it. And um, one day, uh, about, a, about a decade ago, I got an email from a company called Automated Insights. And they had developed a, a piece of software called Wordsmith that they said could function as an artificial intelligence reporter. Basically, it could replace me. And it could do that by scanning these press releases that had all the corporate earnings information in them, automatically recognizing the, the relevant numbers, plugging them into a news story and publishing it in milliseconds with no human input required. And uh, they said in their email that this software had been used to produce 300 million pieces of journalism in a year, um, which I thought, hmm, that's slightly more productive than me, uh, even on a good day. Uh, I'm not producing 300 million pieces of anything. So here I had a problem. I was uh, in the line of fire for, uh, for this AI reporting software. And in that moment, when I was learning about my own pending obsolescence, I was joining a long line of people whose jobs have been challenged by new technology. Um, we all know, you know the story of the, the buggy whip salesmen and the elevator operators, and more recently, the toll booth collectors, these jobs that have become obsolete due to technology. Um, but when I started researching this book, I went back through history, um, re reading histories of the Industrial Revolution, the Gilded Age, the, the Second Industrial Revolution, um, the Computing Revolution, and I found that over and over again, we make this mistake in assessing new technology of saying, well, the machines can do someone else's job. They're very good at that, but they can't do my job. My job is beyond the reach of robots, of machines, of computers, of automation. Um, and there are examples all the way back to the 1800s. In, in the late 1800s, there were people, pundits, who were saying, um, the, the job of the hot air balloonist will never be replaced uh, because there will never be a heavier than air flying machine. And obviously, uh, you know, a couple years later, the Wright brothers flew at Kitty Hawk and the hot air balloonists. Uh, no offense to any of you who are hot air balloonists, but that's not exactly a growth industry these days. Um, in the 1960s, there were, um, as computers were being enlisted to do more and more tasks, um, there were people who predicted that computers would never replace human translators, language translators, interpreters, um, because that job was too complicated for any computer to figure out. Obviously, today we have Google Translate, which processes billions of translated words a day. Um, you know, the, the ranks of human interpreters are thinning out very quickly. And there are now these little earbuds you can wear in your ears uh, from Google that will automatically translate um, as it's coming in to you. So if you're in a foreign country, you just plop in your earbud, somebody speaks to you in Italian, you hear the, the English translation instantaneously. Um, so that is a piece of technology that exists now that is going to make life very hard for people whose job it is to translate. Um, and this pattern, uh, my, my favorite example of this actually was in, in 1984. Um, the automated ticket machine had just been introduced at a JFK airport. And the New York Times sent a reporter out to report on this brand new phenomenon of the ticket machine. And they interviewed a bunch of people, including some travel agents, and said, you know, do you think this is a threat to you or your job. And, and one of the travel agents I love says, well, these things are never going to replace us. What if you just press the wrong button? Uh, like he couldn't imagine a world in which people pressed a button on a computer to get an airline ticket. It just didn't compute for him. Um, and now obviously a lot of us buy airline tickets on the internet, pushing our own buttons, most of the time getting it right. So, uh, in, in my book and in, in, um, in my work for the Times, I write about examples of artificial intelligence and what it can do today, how machine learning algorithms are now better than doctors at diagnosing some types of anomalies and, 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 uh, and pathologies. Um, there are now legal uh, AIs that can spot issues in contracts with much better precision than even the best human lawyers. Um, and these machines are getting better very, very quickly. So 
just as an example, about 10 years ago, I found this program called uh, from Automated Insights that could write 300 million news stories. It was a very basic program. I mean, it was essentially taking words and plugging them into uh, stories. It wasn't what you would call creative at all. It was a pretty rudimentary algorithm. And so I wasn't all that worried about it. Um, but more recently, I've been playing around with this app called PseudoWrite. Um, PseudoWrite was um, built by an engineer uh, in San Francisco. Uh, it uses this AI engine known as GPT-3. Um, GPT-3 is what's called a large language model. It's basically, it, it's a super powered version of the autocomplete feature on your iPhone. It uh, basically, you know, it takes text that you input and it predicts the next words in the sequence of texts. And it does this using a supercomputer that's one of the five biggest supercomputers in the world. It has 285,000 processors. Um, and to build this, the programmers who built this engine scanned 300 billion pieces of text and fed it into an algorithm called a neural network, and then trained that algorithm to do this kind of prediction. Um, and it got really good very, very quickly. So good, in fact, that the company that built it didn't release the source code to the public because they were scared that it would be used to create ultra realistic propaganda and fake news, things that no one would be able to tell apart from human writing. Um, but this guy, uh, the founder of PseudoWrite was able to build something on top of it. So he set up this app called PseudoWrite um, that takes the texts that you put in and completes them in any uh, style that you want. And it's it doesn't need to be trained specifically to do um, any particular kind of writing. So. I, I thought we could do a, a little demo today and uh, and try to automate my job, uh, the the job that I'm doing right now. So, I took a section from uh, from my book uh, earlier uh, earlier this week, and I plugged it into Pseudowrite. Well, first I'll just I'll show you how Pseudowrite works, just so you can get a, a little um, a, a little feel for what we're talking about here. So I'll share my screen. Um, so this is Pseudowrite. And uh, as you can see, it just looks like a word processor. And let's try, I'm, I'm just going to paste in some text from uh, an article in today's New York Times. Let's get that in there. And then um, you'll see it has a button here called wormhole. And wormhole, if you hit that, it shows you some suggestions for what's next in the story. Um, based purely on analyzing the first part that you uh, put in. So this, as you can see, it's, it's, you know, it's recognizable, it's complete sentences, it's all grammatical. And you can either insert that into your copy or you can uh, give it a twist. You can, uh, you know, you can say, what genre am I writing in? Um, what do I want to, to happen next in my story? Um, so it's a pretty amazing piece of technology um, and I've been uh, kind of obsessed with it. So. Here's what happened when I put this uh, passage from my book into it, and I asked it to write me a message for you all tonight. It said, automation and AI are the future, and we need to prepare for them. Automation and AI are not inherently evil, and we shouldn't fear them, and we shouldn't fight them. We need to let it enhance our lives, and we need to let it create new jobs so we can do stimulating and entertaining things because our lives are meant to be more than just work. Pretty good. And, uh, and then I was like, I'll, I'll just give it a little more of a challenge. Uh, that, that seems a little easy. So I asked it to take that same paragraph and rewrite it in the style of William Shakespeare. Um, and, and here's what it said. Oh, humanity, thou art bound to fall to thy doom. Thou shalt become slaves of the machines. They shall make thee toil endless hours. They shall not give thee leave to rest. Thou shalt toil evermore till thou shalt die. Not bad. A little gloomy, but, uh, but not bad in the Shakespeare department. And then just for kicks, I asked it to rewrite that paragraph in the style of Donald Trump. Um, I will not do the Donald Trump voice. Um, but uh, you can just imagine this is, this is an AI's impression of Donald Trump. Automation, the fourth industrial revolution, AI, this is huge. And when I say huge, I'm talking about beyond your wildest dreams. Tremendous, tremendous. It's going to be so great, so fantastic. And folks, I love the robots. They're really incredible. 
They're better than people in many respects. And here's a big secret, beautiful secret. They can be fantastic wives. So a little applause for pseudo right there. Um, thank you for your service, uh, GPT-3. So why am I showing you this? Why, why is this important for us? Well, clearly it's important for me because in the coming years, uh, you know, news organizations, including the one I work for, are going to begin using tools like these to create news stories, to create the kind of you know, routine predictable stories that appear uh, in the newspaper uh, every day. And it won't be every story, I hope not at least, um, but it will be, you know, it already is that organizations like the AP and Reuters are already using AI reporting tools to um, report on corporate earnings. The Los Angeles Times has an AI reporter. Um, every time there's an earthquake in the Los Angeles area, the first story that's published by the LA Times is written by a robot. They have an a AI that gets the data from the seism seismological tools and plugs it into a story and publishes it in seconds after the earthquake. So that's a fun fact. And the, the issue I think for a lot of us is that this is not just happening in one field, this is happening in every field. It's happening simultaneously and it's happening much faster than previous waves of technological change. Um, McKinsey, the, the big consulting firm, um, predicts that by the year 2030, which is only eight years from now, 45 million Americans could lose their jobs to automation. Uh, and, you know, I think the typical image we have of someone losing their job to automation is like a factory worker or maybe a truck driver or a retail cashier. But it's not just going to be truck drivers and fast food workers and, and people in factories. It's going to be doctors, bankers, consultants, musicians, journalists, um, people who do routine cognitive labor, not just routine manual labor. And in fact, there was a study out a couple years ago by Stanford and the Brookings Institution um, that sort of analyzed the text of the patents that were being taken out on AI technologies and compared them to the, the words in job listings, open job listings, and found that actually the most vulnerable jobs were white collar jobs that required college and graduate degrees, that those jobs have a higher chance of being automated in this next wave of AI than more blue collar manual jobs do. So this is pretty depressing. I mean, 45 million jobs in the next eight years is a huge chunk of our economy. So I think we need some answers here. And so a couple of years ago, I started writing this book. I went to every expert I could find in the field of artificial intelligence and automation. I talked to engineers and CEOs and historians and economists, and I asked them what to do, what we as humans can do to prepare for this huge wave of automation. And I expected them to say, you know, well, you got to go to coding boot camp. You got to learn how to be a programmer. You got to learn how to control the robots. Um, you got everyone has to be super, you know, STEM focused and, and oriented because that's, you know, what we've been told for the last 20 to 30 years. But they actually said the opposite. The people that I talked to who really understand this technology what they said was that we needed to get stronger in the areas where computers are weak because computers can't do everything, but they can do a lot. And we need to emphasize our unique human skills. They talked about skills like creativity and empathy and, and emotional intelligence, leadership abilities, those sort of things that we often denigrate as being soft skills. Um, those skills were actually the ones that they told me were the most important. And this blew my mind because how many times have we heard that the way to get a job in the future is to become a programmer? That has been the dogma of the labor market and the educational field for decades now. Um, and so I was fascinated. I thought this is a real um, change in the way that I've been thinking about my own future and the future of all these 45 million people. And then that raised the next question that I had to answer, which is, well, where are our human advantages? What are we better at than today's best computers? And what are we likely to be better at 
for as long as possible? Uh, what, where is our advantage likely to persist over computers? And so I went back to my experts and I said, well, okay, I know that we need to develop these human skills, but like what specifically can we do to make ourselves more resilient and more uh, sort of invulnerable to obsolescence? And I sort of condensed what they told me into three basic rules um, called surprising, social, and scarce. So we humans are better at doing surprising, social, and scarce things better than today's computers, and we are likely to be better at them for a long time. So let's go one by one. So surprising, surprising tasks are tasks that involve changing rules that don't have regular predictable environments where the variables are shifting and you're called upon to make quick decisions with imperfect information. AI really likes rules and regularity, which is why, for example, computers are so good at playing chess, because that is a very orderly game that has the same rules every time. You can play it a million times and get a little bit better each time, and eventually you'll beat the best human chess players in the world. But AI and computers hate surprises. They don't do well with surprises. There's a, a famous experiment that I found uh, in the course of researching this book where these researchers were, um, were testing out this, um, this algorithm that had learned to identify household objects in an image. So you could put up a picture of your living room and this algorithm would tell you, okay, that's a coffee table, that's a TV, uh, that's a bookshelf, et cetera, et cetera. And so they got this algorithm to the point where it was like more than 90% accurate. It was, it was doing very well at identifying these household objects. And then they messed with it. They took a photo of a little baby elephant and they put it into the room in the pictures. And they call this the elephant in the room experiment, uh, get it? Uh, and then they ran the algorithm again. They said, you know, identify the objects in these pictures. And not only could the algorithms not identify the baby elephant in the middle of the living room, they basically had a nervous breakdown. They forgot everything they knew. Their accuracy went down to like, you know, below 50% um, from 90 plus percent, um, even on objects that it had always identified correctly before. So AI hates surprises. It hates everything that is surprising. It likes order and regularity. Therefore, we as humans need to make ourselves, our jobs, our personalities, our lives as surprising as possible, because that is an area where we are going to have a persistent advantage over the machines. Um, you know, jobs that would involve lots of surprising things. Um, one of them is like a, a kindergarten teacher, for example. If you can think about that job, that is a job that is all chaos, no order. And so that's a job that computers are not likely to be able to do ever, or at least for a very long time. So that's, that's the kind of job that I think has a bright future. The second category of thing that they told me, the experts told me was protected somewhat from automation and AI um, are called social tasks. And these are tasks that involve, um, the way I think about it is they don't involve making things, they involve making people feel things. So you know, not manufacturing jobs, not jobs where you are creating PowerPoint presentations or widgets or financial forecasts, but jobs that are fulfilling people's emotional needs. So nurses, therapists, um, people, you know, in the caregiving industries, teachers, but also jobs that we wouldn't necessarily think of as social, like flight attendants, for example, that's a job that is surprisingly social and surprising. So it's, it, it succeeds on two counts. Um, and it's a job that requires a lot of, of social skills. Um, and these uh, jobs are, are plentiful and they're getting more plentiful. And I think they will have a bright future in the years ahead. The third category of task that is somewhat protected from AI and automation is a big category that I call scarce jobs or scarce work. And they're not scarce because there are only a few of these jobs. There are actually a lot of them, but they're jobs that involve sort of high stakes, low probability situations, sort of outlier situations, um, things where the margin for error is very 
uh, is very low. Um, jobs that involve unusual skills or combinations of skills, or that just involve excellence. Like, you know, the best Olympic swimmer in the world is not going to get replaced by, you know, we already have machines that go faster than the swimmer. They're called boats, um, but we still watch the swimmer on TV and they make a lot of money because we like to see humans do excellent things. Um, a non-Olympian example of a scarce job would be something like a 911 operator. Today, if you call 911 to report an emergency anywhere in the country, a human picks up the phone. And it's not because we don't know how to automate that job. We have the technology. You could install one of those, you know, automated systems that goes, you know, press one to report a robbery in progress or press two if your cat stuck up a tree or whatever it is. Um, we could do that. But we have decided as a society that that is a job that is too important to entrust to a machine. The stakes are too high. When we call 911, we want someone who's going to be on the other side of that call to understand intuitively what's wrong and how to help us and to do it as quickly as possible. And those are the three categories. So surprising, social, and scarce. And that's, that's sort of the heart of, of this book that I, I wrote is just sort of giving examples of those three in action. And what I love about these three words, surprising, social, and scarce, is that they have nothing to do with your job title. I mean, it's not like there are jobs that are 100% surprising, social, and scarce, and jobs that are 0% surprising, social, and scarce. Most jobs have a combination of tasks that are very human and very machine-like. And any job can be made more resilient by making it more surprising, social, and scarce. Um, one of the examples I talk about in my book is um, my accountant, a uh, guy who does my taxes. His name is Russ. He lives in St. Louis. Awesome guy. And, uh, and tax preparation is, if, if you go to, there's an, uh, an Oxford study a few years ago that ranked uh, you know, hundreds of occupations by their likelihood of being automated. Tax preparer was literally the number one job on that list that is going to be automated because of TurboTax and you know, various software programs that help people with their taxes. So if, if Russ had been looking at that study, he would have been very freaked out and he might have said, maybe I need to go become a nurse or something because there's no future in tax preparation for me. But luckily for Russ, he doesn't think that way. And also luckily for Russ is that he is not just a tax preparer. Before he got his uh, CPA uh, license, he was a stand-up comedian. So he's extremely funny, as you might expect. And in his tax firm, he hired a bunch of other former stand-up comedians and comedy writers. And so this is a tax firm that is filled with comedians, which sounds like the premise of like a very bad sitcom, um, but is in fact their actual business plan. And they specialize in doing taxes for artists and actors and entertainers and writers and all kinds of people in creative industries. And I asked Russ about this one day. I said like, did, you know, why do you do this? Why did you hire all these comedians? And, and he said, well, like, we are not selling tax advice. We are selling an experience. And we want that experience to be human. We want people to come away feeling not that this was a chore that they had to get through, but maybe that this was something that they actually enjoyed. Like I, people don't believe me when I say that I actually have fun doing my taxes. Like <laughs> I think I might be the only person in America who has fun doing my taxes, but, um, but it's because Russ and his team are are all very attuned to the emotional side of uh, of doing uh, of, of of doing people's taxes. Um, he also pays for all of his employees to take regular improv comedy lessons. So it, it's a skill that you wouldn't think translates, and yet because it's able to sort of raise the number of skills in that job that are surprising, social, and scarce, and that are human, that are, that are sort of deeply unautomatable he has been able to avoid the fate of so many of his tax preparer colleagues. His firm is thriving while they are laying off all their people and getting replaced by robots. And these skills can also work for big companies. They can work for, uh, in, in my book, I, I write about the example of uh, Best Buy. Uh, Best Buy, I'm sure all of you have been there. I used to buy all my computer stuff there. Um, and 
a decade or so ago, the conventional wisdom was that Best Buy was going to die. Um, their stock price was in the gutter. Um, everyone thought, you know, Amazon is going to totally crush them and put them out of business. And I don't know if you remember, you know, stores like, uh, you know, Comp USA or, 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 you know, stores like that, that all went out of business because they couldn't compete with these e-commerce companies. And, um, and Best Buy didn't die. It, um, it actually has been thriving and its stock prices at an all time high. It's been opening up more locations. It's basically the only, you know, big box electronics retailer that survived. And I got real curious about that. And so I called up the CEO, this guy named uh, Thurston Hines, and he's a, uh, he's a lovely French guy. And um, he, I asked him, like, how did you do this? Why did, um, why did Best Buy not fail like all of its peers? And he told me that they had basically made human interaction the centerpiece of their business. So you think of Best Buy as being a place where you get electronics. They think of it as a place to provide human services around electronics. And the way that they did this was they started this program called the in-house, the in-home advisor program. I don't know if you've, any of you have used it. It's, it's a great program. Basically, Best Buy will send someone out to your house um, to, uh, you know, to, to say, well, I need a new stereo system. Which stereo system is going to sound best in this space? Or how can I get the right size TV for my living room? Or, you know, what kind of vacuum cleaner do I need? And they will come out and basically be like a personal tech concierge for you. And that's something that Amazon doesn't do. Amazon won't send someone to your, to your house because they're all about robots and automation and efficiency. But Best Buy have found this niche where by being more human than their competitors, they were able to survive. Um, this, this sort of idea of being more human to sort of offset the effects of automation, it also applies to cities and communities. Um, I got very interested a couple years ago in the case of um, Waterloo, Ontario. Anyone ever, anyone from Waterloo, anyone been to Waterloo? It's a, it's a sort of suburb and um, it uh, for many years was best known as the headquarters of Blackberry. Remember Blackberries? Uh, <laughs> I used to love my Blackberry. Um, I bet none of you have Blackberries anymore. Um, because they got basically killed by the iPhone when that came out. Um, and Waterloo was a real company town. I mean, every it's sort of like Rochester, New York and Kodak or something. I mean, like every other person in town worked for BlackBerry at its peak. And when the company sort of took a dive, the town was expected to go with it. And there were all these, you know, predictions that it would be a, you know, huge recession and housing values would plummet and jobs would flee. And instead, the opposite happened. They got, you know, their unemployment rate today in Waterloo is lower than it was when BlackBerry was at its peak. Housing values are up, the community's thriving. And so I was like, how did this happen? I, I sort of think of these things as mysteries and I, and I had to go up there and, and solve it. And I thought that the answer was going to be you know, like we, uh, you know, we, we convinced everyone to go to, you know, to programming school and, and we, you know, made them all science majors and now they got good jobs, but they, it was basically that they were human to each other. They had these, um, what I call big nets and small webs. They had these, you know, these so Canadian social service programs that made it easier for people to get laid off, you know, unemployment insurance, healthcare, things like that. It wasn't an existential risk to lose your job. Um, but they also had all these mutual aid networks. They had, you know, companies in town that were hosting job fairs, that were providing free office space and, you know, free tools to help people get back on their feet. They really took this as a community project to sort of get each other through this technological shift. Um, and it really worked. So um, where does that leave us? I, I, think, I think there are a couple things that I want to sort of leave you with today, and then we can do a lot of questions. And I'm, I'm eager to hear what you all think about this. Um, one is that we need to become more human. And we need to do so at a time when the technology in our lives, a lot of it is trying to make us less human. Um, you can sort of think about your own use of technology, or I can think about my own use of technology. And, and you know, every day I, I wake up and I look at my phone 
and I pay attention to the things that the phone tells me to. I look at my text messages. I look at my social media. I look at my Facebook. I look at my Twitter. I, you know, I, I go on Amazon and I say, what brand of dog food should I buy? I let, you know, machines can make that decision for me. I go on Spotify and I say, well, I'll just use their algorithmically generated playlists. Um, you know, even our, our, the way our social media works is sort of encouraging us to behave like machines um, because that what's, that's what makes the social network uh, the most money. So that's the first task that I think we all need to do is to, um, to sort of make ourselves more human at a time when technology is trying to make us less human. And then I think we also need to, um, to get better at sharing our knowledge and our skills with others. One of the most sort of revelatory conversations I had in the course of, of writing this book, I, I took a long walk with um, a guy who uh, is a big time, uh, you know, AI expert, um, he, you know, works in AI, one of these big tech companies, and he's been doing this for, you know, years and years and years and, and very well known in the field. And he said, one advantage that computers have over humans is networked intelligence. I said, well, what do you mean? What does networked intelligence mean? He says, when one computer learns to do something, they all learn. When one self-driving Tesla learns to recognize a motorcycle, it teaches all of the other Teslas in the network to recognize the motorcycle. When one computer learns to play chess at a superhuman level, it teaches all the other computers to learn how to play chess at that level. Humans aren't like that. We don't share our knowledge and our skills readily as much as we should. And we, we hide it away. We keep it for ourselves. We silo it inside companies or research labs or something. We are not very good at bringing each other up to speed. Um, so that's a thought I would leave you with too, is that not only do we need to make ourselves more human, but as we're doing that, we need to make sure that we have networked intelligence, that we share what we know with the people around us, so that we can all become more human together. Uh, thank you, that's all I have. And I wanna take questions and anything you wanna ask, I'm happy to answer for the remainder of the time. We have a couple of <clears throat> questions and comments on the chat, Kevin. Uh, the first is on taxes and humor, Justice Ginsburg's husband used to say that tax law was the only really funny subject in law school. Where else could you study human greed every day? That's funny. Uh, I'm not sure my my wife, uh, who's a, a lawyer, would, would agree with that, but she's not a tax lawyer, so maybe she's missing out on some real comedy. Um, great. Well, I, I, I'll just go down these questions um, or you can just unmute yourselves and, and ask. That's that's fine, too. Marjorie, how do you how do you want to do this? It's up to you, Kevin. OK. Um, I'll answer uh, Carol's question. She says Barack Obama was tied to his Blackberry. Have there been any stories on how its demise has affected them, has affected him? Uh, there have been some stories about sort of Blackberry nostalgia in general. Now, I don't think I've seen anything with Barack Obama specifically. I'm sure he uses an iPhone now like everyone else. Um, but I, I also think that it's, uh, you know, the, the genre of, of technology nostalgia is very deep. And I, I think, you know, I miss certain aspects of my Blackberry. What I miss most, and I, I write about this a little bit in the book, I feel like my phone used to be my assistant and then at some point it became my boss. And, <laughs> and part of what I am trying to do now is to demote my phone. I want it to be my assistant again, because I'm sick of it being my boss. And I think that happened sometime between the Blackberry and you know my iPhone I have in my pocket right now. It got a promotion. And, um, and I don't think phones make very good bosses. I think we should you know, try to be our own bosses. Uh, and so one of the chapters in my book is called uh, Demote Your Devices, and it's all about how to kind of take these tools and not abstain from them, not, you know, become a hermit who lives in the woods and uses no technology at all, but, um, but to use these tools in a way that actually helps us, that is our assistant rather than our boss. So I thought that was a fun way into that. 
Um, what is the likelihood of education? Don asks, what is the likelihood of education that uses lecture becoming more able to use AI? Um, education is not immune to AI. Um, there are, um, you know, programs that can, you know, do what's called personalized learning. They can basically tailor a curriculum to a student. Um, there have been some experiments with that. Um, there's now a lot of AI in being used in education, especially with the Zoom classes that everyone's been taking for the past couple of years. Um, there are now companies that sell software that will um, track your eye movements through your camera to see if you're cheating on a test or not, um, to you know see if you're paying attention during a lecture. Um, I, I don't think that sounds very fun at all. I, in fact, I'm, I'm uh, pretty horrified by that, but that is a way that technology is being used and AI is being used in the classroom today. And I think that there will still be a role for teachers. Um, there was this moment maybe a decade ago where everyone in Silicon Valley thought that the future was these so-called MOOCs, these massive open online courses where no one would go to school anymore because we'd all just watch our school on YouTube or something. Uh, and that has not happened. Although, you know, those classes, some of them are very popular, but they're not substituting for the experience of being in a classroom with, a, with another human, with a class full of people. Um, let's see, um, Bruce Richards asks, in the social category, you said that therapists were somewhat safe, yet there have been therapist programs. Um, how are they doing? I assume you mean like therapist AI programs. Um, I wrote about this a little bit in the book. There's some, been some interesting um, experiments in this. There was a, a Stanford team that came out with a, a, a therapy bot a few years ago. And uh, basically, instead of talking with a therapist, you would just converse with this chat bot and it would kind of ask you questions and then, you know, try to answer, you know, sort of ask you, you know, questions that made sense for your sort of line of inquiry. And uh, the, the studies found that this was, you know, somewhat effective, not, not necessarily as effective as a, as a human therapist, but uh, a whole lot cheaper and, um, and more sort of readily available. So I think that the, 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 the sort of therapy is a, is a really hard one for AI um, to ever replace because so much of what people go to therapy for is the experience of having a human to human conversation. Now, does that mean that there won't be AI coaches in addition to the therapists? Does that mean, you know, there won't be bots that are reminding us to drink water or eat healthy or, you know, uh, you know, like do, you know, exercise uh, in a, on a daily basis? There definitely will be and are already AI coaches that you can use for that. But I don't think they will fully replace the, uh, the, the, the occupation of therapist. Um, Mary asks, how can we keep AI writing from spreading misinformation even more effectively than current pseudo news sites? Any way to recognize it? Unfortunately, there's not a good way to recognize it. Um, there have been some uh, attempts to sort of write algorithms that can tell when text is being generated by other algorithms, um, but it's not a technological solution, I don't think, is going to be, that's not going to be how we deal with this. It's going to have to be by sort of upgrading our mental hardware, um, being more thoughtful, um, you know, news consumers, um, being more vigilant about finding sources, um, you know, doing the research into, into a, you know, an organization that's publishing something. I think it's really gonna be about our discernment as, um, as consumers. And so, you know, I don't love the term digital literacy because um, I think it's sort of, you know, implies that there's a correct way to read the internet. Um, but I do think that we all need to become more thoughtful um, about the, the information that we're getting on the internet. Um, Carol asks, in your opinion, what popular devices, software, and websites can we manage to do without for the rest of our lives? Um, well, uh, let's see. Um, I am not a huge fan of, uh, there's a category of, um, well, I'll, I'll answer this this way. So there's a category of software that I really hate right now, and I call it bossware. And I don't think it's sort of in the popular category of, um, you know, it's not something that most people 
you know, on this call would use every day, but it's a category of software that basically uses AI to do the work that your boss used to do. So like if you're an Amazon warehouse and you're a worker, you, your boss is an algorithm. You, you might, you might have a nominal human supervisor, but you are taking directions from an app every day, all day. You're doing what it tells you to do. You're putting this into this box because the machine said it. So there's a category, and, and this is happening in white collar industries too. There are now um, companies are requiring their remote workforces to install tracking software that monitors what they're doing on their computer so they can tell you, you know, you took a break to watch a Netflix show for 20 minutes and it wasn't on your schedule. What, you know, what were you doing? So that category of software, I think is just, it's, it's really demoralizing. It's really um, ineffective. And I think it's, you know, we could wipe it from the face of the earth and I'd be pretty happy about it. Um, I, I like, that's not sort of answering your question because you asked about popular um, devices, software and websites. I think social media is, um, is a real can of worms. I mean, there are very um, useful ways to use it, but just the passive scrolling you know, that so many people include, and I'm not exempting myself from this, I do it too, but just the passive mindless, like filling the gaps in the day scrolling, um, I think can be really, um, can be really damaging for people. So um, I'd advise people to be careful on that. Um, wow, a lot of great questions here. Um, Sandy asks, it seems unlikely that corporations will be willing to share information if profits might suffer. Do you think your advice to be more human might be a little idealistic? Uh, it's possible. Um, I, but I think that actually the profit incentive for businesses to become more human is actually there. I think it's, you know, we've seen lots of examples. Best Buy is just one of many. There are, you know, dozens um, out there of, of companies that have succeeded by becoming more human. Like you can think of the whole sort of like farm to table restaurant movement as a kind of humanization of food. You know, they're not just going to bring you the pork chop. They're going to tell you what, you know, farm it came from and how the pig was raised and what its name was. And, you know, like they'll, they'll, uh, they'll give you an experience rather than just handing you a plate of food. Um, and so a lot of businesses are sort of adopting that model, whether it's like concierge, uh, you know, gyms where they give you real personal attention, um, you know, sort of service companies that, that make sure to go the extra mile for you. So the, I think, I think businesses actually have an incentive to become more human. Um, Anne asks, how did I prepare myself to have my specialty in technology? Um, well, uh, I'm a big nerd. That's the short answer to that question. And, uh, you can ask, uh, you know, anyone who, who, uh, has, uh, seen me at, at Kendall, like, you know, looking down at my phone during, uh, during dinner, but I've always been obsessed with technology. I had, you know, computers growing up and my first job, uh, was building websites with my brother. So, uh, long, uh, history of being interested in this stuff. And, um, you know, I didn't, prepare myself specifically. I was actually a, as, as, um, as was mentioned in my intro, I was, a, I was a religion reporter before I was a, a tech reporter. So this is just something that I sort of came home to after a couple other kinds of assignments. Um, Kathy asks, you say that there is a future for teachers, but the profession has been undervalued and underpaid for a long time. COVID has burned a lot of teachers out. How do you see people who are good at teaching taking advantage of their skills that can't be replicated by AI? Yeah, this is a great question because right now there is a mismatch between the jobs that are very human, that are likely to survive automation, and the jobs that are well compensated. I mean, nurses now are, are making a lot of money because they, you know, there's a shortage of them. Um, but in normal non-COVID times, you know, that job is, is not as remunerative as it maybe should be. Teachers, I would say the same thing. Um, and I think that part of that will be, I, I hate sort of saying like the market will fix this, but I, I do think that as these skills become more valuable, which they, they will, we know that from looking at what previous waves of technological shifts have done value flows to the things that the machines can't do. So I think the teachers will be eventually um, sort of 
compensated commensurate with their with the value that they're providing to society. But I think in the meantime, you know, we need things like uh, you know, we need things like unions. We need things like maybe a universal basic income to make sure that everyone has a minimum standard of living. Um, we can't just solve this through the market. It also has to come from the public sector as well. Um, and I think teachers, you know, who are very human can, you know, some of them um, are, you know, in classrooms. Some of them might be doing things adjacent to teaching. Some of them might be running, you know, uh, daycares. Some of them might be, you know, writing um, educational websites or making educational YouTube videos. There are many ways to educate beyond um, being in the classroom. Marjorie writes, uh, we hear about the use of robots in elder care. To what extent do you think this will happen and how do you feel about it? I mean, I think I should probably be asking you all this question because you're you're much closer to you, you probably see robots that I don't even know exist yet um, in in some of your facilities. But I think that the the use of robots in elder care is um, on one level um, we don't want to sort of say that it's it's all bad because it's certainly not. Um, and there have been some studies, for example, that found um, that there are so these robots um, that can be sort of used with um, people experiencing dementia, that you know you can actually have a sort of conversational robot there in the room with you and that that has some beneficial effects over the long term. So I think there are robots that can be used in care. I think there are certainly things that could you know help people with mobility and things like that. I mean, uh, you know those, Electric scooters are are kind of robots, um, and and a lot of people use them. You know, walkers, and I mean, those were technology once. Now we just think of them as you know objects. Um, but I think those you know those could be thought of as robots, and I'm sure we'll have better and and more uh, and smarter technology in the coming years. You know, self driving cars I think will be huge for uh, for elderly people who maybe you know aren't driving themselves anymore. Um, they, you know, they're already testing some, um, in, in Florida, there's a, an, uh, elder care community that is testing self-driving cars for its residents because, you know, it's a way to get around and, and, you know, when you're not driving yourself anymore. Um, Bruce says sharing knowledge has been complicated with scientists placing a premium value on the sharing of information, but there's a value on intellectual property, copyright patents for monopolistic control of profit. How can we promote sharing of information as computers do against the tide of knowledge as property? It's a great question. Um, I, I think one, um, one example of, of this going right is in the open source software community. So uh, if you're familiar with computer programming, sort of a lot of code out there is what's called open source. It's just made public. And anyone can use it, anyone can copy it, anyone can make their own version of it. Um, and it's all sort of kept in these public repositories that sort of sort of like libraries for programmers. And so if you need a button that lets you pay for something, you don't have to invent that from scratch. You can just go get someone else's button and you know make it suit your design and plug it in. Um, and so that saves a lot of sort of sort of trouble of. I don't know, people inventing things that have already been invented um, because that's not a useful use of anyone's time. So I think we, we could, and that, that open source software has been tremendously valuable for the industry. I mean, pr programmers will tell you it's, it's the foundation of AI. It's the foundation of a lot of um, computerized sort of breakthroughs and research. Um, and so that's a big debate in the community of, of programmers is you know, open source versus closed source. And so I think we need to move to a more open source society, not just for programmers, but for all of us, you know, journalists need to do better at sharing what we know, um, you know, people in creative fields need to let people, you know, into their process and, and mentor, you know, the next generation. So I think we can do much better at that, no matter what, what our jobs are. Um, Randy has his hand raised. Yes, you invited us to unmute to ask a question, if that's okay. And uh, sure. I think this is a much more human way to ask a question personally, since that's what you're asking us to do. And I, this is not so much of a question as a comment. I obviously, for anything that might be listening, I for one 
welcome our new AI overlords, you know, absolutely. But, um, uh, you know, we, I'm not as pessimistic as, uh, as, as, as you seem to be earlier. For example, you gave a statistic about all the jobs lost. And I think it's only fair to ask the other side is how many jobs are gained through AI. And as an example, I just saw in the news the other day, um, AI has suggested a new series of structures for antibiotics that had never really been thought of before. And this is a new area that it will take a lot of human input to proceed with that. But that is something very, that, that is very new that they probably would not have gotten from looking at current antibiotics, which is a way we often used to do it. Another example, you mentioned chess a couple of times. And, um, you know, when these new chess programs came out that could beat the best human players in the world, you know, we've gotten to the point, the only thing that can beat those programs are bigger machines. And I, probably a lot of people thought that, that chess would die off. And that is partly due to the pandemic, I guess. A lot of us have started watching chess games and playing online. But it turns out that having that engine available is a huge boon to the entertainment value of chess because you can real time see what's going on. And uh, even at the highest level, the AI has suggested some ideas and openings in mid game that no one had thought of before. And it's really changed the way a lot of, even the highest level grandmasters are thinking about the game. So I just think there's a, a huge number of opportunities that, that this, this rises. And it kind of reminds me of the old, um, I don't know if you all read Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, but you know they invented this biggest computer in the universe that could answer any question. The only problem is they didn't know exactly what question to ask. And, and that was what was the, the holdup to the whole thing. So um, anyway, I just wanted to say that I, I really enjoyed your talk gave me a lot of things to think about. But overall, I think there are some, a lot of good things that are coming along with it, as well as the negative things. And I'm a little more optimistic than, than uh, you might have thought of going into it. So thank you for the great presentation. Yeah, thank you, Andy. And, and I should say, I am, I am, uh, I admire and I share your optimism. I think there will be um, lots of new opportunities created by AI. Um, I think that the the thing that gives me pause is not actually the the technology. Um, most of the time, it's the humans who are implementing the technology. And and are we using this technology in a way that makes people's lives better and makes their jobs easier and more fulfilling, or are we using it to surveil people and you know uh, ask more from them, push them beyond their capabilities, um, you know, treat them inhumanely. Um, and I think there's a big question. There will certainly be jobs that are created by technology, just as there will be jobs that are destroyed by technology. That's the way it's always been. The question is, are those new jobs available to the same, are, are they accessible to the same people who lost their jobs? And if not, how do you retrain these people to do these jobs? And how do you support them in the meantime? Because it's not always going to be um, a, a simple thing to go from being, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, an accountant to a, a person who analyzes protein structures using a machine learning module. So it, I think we need a huge investment in, uh, in training people in getting them ready for the new jobs, because it's not always the case, sadly, that the new jobs are in the same geographic place, accessible to the same people, um, utilizing the same skills as the jobs that were lost. Uh, Mary asks, can AI help local newspapers survive? Can it scout out local news to report? Um, probably not. Um, I think local newspapers, uh, sadly, <laughs> are, are in trouble for reasons that have nothing to do with AI. Um, or very little to do with AI, but I think that um, you know the work of of shoe leather reporting of you know going to the city council meeting and 
you know, going to the, you know, finding out the, the sort of story behind the story of some, something going on in town. Like that's, that's hard. That's hard for humans to do. It's hard, harder, even harder for machines to do. So I think there will be, unfortunately, a lot of AI in local newspapers, because as these companies cut their budgets, they're going to lay off human reporters and try to do as much as possible with software. This is already happening. A lot of um, real estate listings in newspapers, for example, are totally written by machines now. Um, you know, a lot of earnings reports, you know, stuff, stuff that's syndicated from the AP and, and other places, a lot of that stuff is being written by algorithms already. So um, unfortunately, I don't think there's a ton of good news on the horizon there, but I'm, I'm hopeful that um, there will also be tools that uh, help journalists in addition to replacing us. Uh, Don asks, what is the future of AI being incorporated or implanted into people to enhance our abilities? Well, Don, I should tell you that I have attached to my body right now a supercomputer that has the best AI in the world written by hundreds of PhDs um, that is the product of billions of dollars of research and development um, to satisfy my every need and enhance my abilities. Um, and and uh, I'll show it to you. It's my, this, this is my robot. Um, so I, I think that we, we do have um, adjacencies to uh, machines. I don't know if they're gonna be literally implanted in our skin. Um, I think that there are probably some issues with that. It's very hard to upgrade hardware if it's like inside your skull. Uh, as we know, technology goes obsolete. You wouldn't want a BlackBerry hanging around under your skin. Um, but I do think there will be some, I mean, there now people are developing um, what, what are called brain computer interfaces where you can instruct a computer to do things based solely on your brain activity. So no, no fingers, no typing, no clicking, just thoughts. Um, and there are... Uh, research labs and companies that are experimenting with that now. Um, and so that'll be, that'll be really nice, especially for people who have uh, disabilities, um, people who you know, can't use fingers to type, um, that will be really useful for them. I don't know that we're all gonna be cyborgs with like, you know, uh, you know antennas coming out of our necks or whatever. Kevin, yes. <clears throat> Kevin, you may be a nerd, but you are also a brilliant teacher. We've learned so much from you tonight and we've been royally entertained every minute of it. Thank you so very much. Thank you all for coming. What a treat. I see my Aunt Deb and Uncle David down there. Hi, hi guys. Good to see you. Miss you. All right. <laughs>